Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, everybody. I'm Aaron Keller, and we are waiting for court to resume in the Tex McIver case out of Atlanta, Georgia, the case of a former attorney who is now sitting in the defendant's chair facing murder charges related to the death of his wife, Diane McIver. The state says it was murder or maybe manslaughter at a minimum. He says it was an accident, that a weapon that he was holding in his lap went off accidentally passed from the back seat to the front seat of the car that he and his wife and a friend were riding in and that his wife ultimately died of the injuries. A tricky case for the state because so much of the state's theory was knocked to smithereens, you could say, earlier today. Beth Karras is here along with me on Law and & Crime. And Beth, look, they're saying that this was a financial motive, but we heard testimony earlier that ultimately the defendant changed his own will to go along with what his wife apparently wanted but didn't get a chance to put in her own will. So does that knock the state's theory completely out of the water here? Well, it certainly it certainly does call it into question, but there were some questions asked of the witness about, and this was the mother of the godson, um, whether or not her copy of it had a blue back to it, meaning it was an official document, that blue back that legal documents have. It's sort of a little thicker paper and stapled at the top. I don't know that that's necessarily a sign of an official will, but it seemed to be in this you know, Georgia courtroom. So let's see how that issue continues to play out during the trial. Maybe they, you know, the defense is poking some holes in it right now, but I'm not convinced uh, that it's out of the case yet because the evidence is still being presented. I mean, I think by my count, they're on witness 43. That's a lot of witnesses. Well, they keep saying that this trial is going to go on for weeks and weeks. And here's the interesting thing. The witness that they just called to the stand and we're waiting for the questioning to begin apparently is the assistant district attorney of Fulton County, Georgia. That's interesting. I can't say as though I've seen that before. I'm waiting to see what this guy is going to say. I'm not sure how he made himself a witness. It could be a prior case or something. I'm not sure. I know that I took a statement once from some um, people I was prosecuting and made myself a witness because I didn't have a cop in the room with me. So, I'm, so sometimes prosecutors can become witnesses. Yeah, it looks like we have sound back from the courtroom again. Tex McIver, a former attorney facing murder charges. And where you currently work? Uh, my name is Mike Sprinkle, and I'm a senior assistant district attorney at the office of the Fulton County District Attorney. And tell the jurors how long you have been with the Fulton County District Attorney's Office? Since June of 2011, so uh, about seven years. Okay. And where are you currently assigned within the DA's office here? I'm assigned to the Major Case Division. And what does it mean in your specific role to be assigned to the Major Case Division? Well, I'm the head of the unindicted homicide unit. Uh, I oversee the pretrial investigation of all unindicted homicides in the county. Uh, this involves preparing the cases for presentation to the grand jury and uh, the trial that will likely occur thereafter. Um, and as part of your role at the DA's office and sort of assisting with investigations, um, and getting a case ready for indictment and eventually trial. Um, tell the jury a little bit about the types of things um, that you do for the cases that you work on. Well, this is all sorts of things. Generally, uh, what I do is I receive a case file from any of the various law enforcement agencies across Fulton County. Commonly, this is the Atlanta Police Department, but there's numerous other agencies, the Fulton County Police Department, Sandy Springs Police Department, et cetera. I take a look at the documents that they provide me, any of the reports that have been drafted by officers, et cetera, including, in addition to that, audio and video files that consist of witness interviews, crime scene photos, anything, pretty much everything in the case file apart from the, generally speaking, the evidence itself, like anything that was recovered from the crime scene, and that generally stays in the police department until trial, although there are exceptions to that. And after I review the case file, I then identify potential areas that need further investigation. Uh, this oftentimes involves cell phone records analysis, uh, forensic analysis of cellular telephones. What's the end? I'm sorry, I apologize. Can I come? Okay. I want me to make that a speak, a long speaking objection. No, if, if you would like me to say, let's move this along, I'm happy to do that if you have the more The answer to that is definitely yes, but I, okay. <laughs> but I, but I think there's some problems. Okay. 
We're getting some back and forth there between the attorneys and the judge, waiting to see exactly how they're going to settle this issue. Again, we have a member of the prosecution office team on the witness stand, and we were just starting to get into exactly why that person was taking the stand. And then, of course, the objections blew up, and we're in the midst of a sidebar, presumably trying to settle those issues. Beth Karras. This is getting a little bit interesting now, uh, as we were saying. So we know that this guy may have just been present for something really important that maybe the defendant said. Correct. And anything a defendant said obviously can come in in the prosecution's case. The defense can't just put in any statement from the defendant without putting him on the stand. But they're going to fight tooth and nail if this is something that they feel I don't, shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't come in. I, I, I don't really know you know, what the objection is at, at sidebar, uh, but um, it'll be interesting because we know that Tex McIver has given various stories about what happened that night, although there's one thing he seems to be consistent about, and that it was an accident. It's just how the accident happened. Well, it, it's not an accident that he has concocted a couple of different versions of this. He's told people a couple of different versions of it himself. Does it necessarily mean he's guilty, or does it mean that he's the kind of guy who's just used to controlling the narrative as an attorney? Well, uh, you raise a, a good point. It may be that he's just, you know, controlling the narrative, as you say. However, you know, I I have questions about this case, and reasonable doubt doesn't mean innocence. I mean, he we know he shot her, but what do you label this? Whenever manner of death is the is the issue in the case, which is well, it's not. I mean, it's a homicide, but whether or not it's a crime or an accident is is the issue. I mean. It was death at the hands of another. That's a definition of a homicide, but he's saying it's an accident. It's a different type of conclusion that a medical examiner reaches. We haven't heard the, uh, from a medical examiner here, but obviously she didn't kill herself. So he's saying it's an accident, but I shot her. These are fascinating cases because you got to go way outside the autopsy room to figure out what's going on. So you have to look at their marriage. And maybe it wasn't as great as, um, as a lot of people have portrayed it to be. However, um, is this a tough wrote a hope for the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he intended to kill his wife that night. Yeah. At a minimum, a manslaughter. He was very reckless in the handling of his gun. Yeah, it looks like we've got more live testimony, so let's go back to court. The defendant and also Thomas Carter, uh, but I believe to make this exhibit, I just pulled up the spreadsheet that is one of the MacGyver's phone records. And I uh, filtered out all calls except for those flying between Thomas Hart. So this, that's pretty much all this was. And then I cut and pasted those results onto a different spreadsheet, which I then printed out, which is what you have here. But before I did that, I also changed the time. By default, the time on, these were AT&T cell phone records, the time is in UTC time, which is four hours ahead. Uh, of Eastern Standard Time, uh, well, five hours ahead during the winter, um, but four hours ahead, this would have been October, so it was four hours ahead, so I subtracted four hours, and the accurate time is displayed on the records that are on states, the states exhibit that you have in front of me. All right, and did you make that adjustment that you just told the jury about on all of the summaries that were repeated, you were repeated related to this case? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, did you also order and eventually obtain any cell phone records for landlines or home phones related to this case? I did. The, the defendant had a landline phone at a condo that serviced the condominium on Kingsborough Road, and he also had a landline phone that serviced a property in Putnam County at Pea Ridge Road. And did you create a disk with your initials on it related to those specific records? The landline record? Yes. Yes. Right, and Your Honor, at this time, it has been attended by way of certification, states exhibit 412. Yes. Is it landline for both addresses you mentioned? Yes. Okay.
Council. A little bit more back and forth by the attorneys there, but ultimately we found out why this assistant prosecutor is on the witness stand. It sounds like he's there to introduce telephone records, which is interesting because most of the time when we see phone records introduced, it's either through an investigator from a law enforcement agency, police, sheriff, not a prosecutor, or it's through someone from a cell phone company who is subpoenaed and called to the witness stand. So this is a, an interesting process, an interesting procedural thing that we're witnessing here. But we're going to be back to live testimony in a moment. For now, we have to take a break. We'll be back here live in a moment on the Law and Crime Network. Well, the judge started to ask about a break there, but it looks like another witness is coming into the courtroom to take the stand. The last witness showing pictures of the vehicle. Now, we're trying to figure out whether or not the point he was ultimately getting at is whether the light was red and the vehicle was stopped or whether it was moving around the time that the gun went off. Or it could have been simply to show the path the vehicle was taking and confirm it. So uh, that was some of the reason that we had the preceding testimony up. But it looks like, again, we've got another witness about to take the stand here. Presumably, the judge is going to take an afternoon break at some point, And there was some discussion about that. They seem to think that they're going to be able to push through this witness before they get to that point. Beth Karras, it looks like the prosecution is calling every single possible person that the prosecution could possibly call. And that pattern continues. Yeah, but you can't blame them because... That Tex McIver shot his wife is not in dispute. It's what motivated him to do it. So they are going to turn over every stone in and show this jury every possible piece of evidence related to what they say is the motive, um, apparently a financial motive, that he was not in as, uh, as financially secure position as his wife. Um, although it's, it's it seems like they had, a good, they had a good marriage otherwise. So, I, I mean... I, it's a tough, it's, it's a really tough case. I do not envy this jury, but they're going to put on a pile of witnesses. We're going to probably hear from a firearms expert, too, at some point. Yeah, at some point. Let's go back to court because we've got another witness taking the stand here. We'll be able to show a little bit of this before we take our next break. Yes, so in. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Hudson. Good afternoon, Mr. Rucker. Um, could you please start out by uh, introducing yourself to the jurors, turn and face them? And uh, tell them your name and tell them how you are employed. Hi, my name is Harold Hudson and I'm a lawyer. I own a law firm here in town. Okay. And um, uh, could you share the name of your firm? The Hudson Law Firm LLC. Okay. And uh, can you tell the jurors um, you are licensed to practice law in the state of Georgia? I am. And can you share with them what types of law do you? focus on primarily. We have another witness taking the stand in the Tex McIver case out of Atlanta, Georgia. This is an attorney. We're going to bring you more of his testimony at the back end of this break, but for now we need to break away from testimony. Again, you're watching the Law and Crime Network live on Crime and Investigation. We'll be back to the Tex McIver case in just a moment. Welcome back, everybody. You're watching Law and Crime Live, and welcome again to those of you watching on the Crime and Investigation Network. The Tex McIver trial is in the midst of a 10-minute break, and as soon as we're back with live testimony about 10 minutes from now, we're going to take you back to the courtroom live. In the meantime, some critical testimony about this process we've been hearing so much about, about making a new will, in essence, for the defendant and the victim. Beth Karras is here along with me to break this all down. We just heard some really important stuff on the witness stand. Questions about what was happening to the ranch. And here's the thing, Beth. It sounded to me like it wasn't an issue about what was going to happen to the ranch if one of them died. It was an issue or a disagreement about what would happen once both of them had died. And I think if I'm interpreting this witness's testimony properly, that was the issue. Did it go to Tex McIver's children, or did it go to the godson, Austin? This wasn't a debate about yanking it out from underneath him if, for instance, she died and he was still alive. That's what I took from that. Well, right. What I take from it is that she wanted assurance that her godson was going to get the ranch because they Possibly. would tell him all the time, even as a little boy, this will be yours someday. And how it wasn't really written that way into the will. I mean, he couldn't testify to it without looking at records because he didn't recall. But he said that if 
if they had changed the joint tenancy to an LLC, it would have affected the rights of survivorship. But, but the way it was written, both, as far as we know, there was no guarantee that Austin was getting the ranch. Presumably, they both could have owned the LLC. So in essence, it, it could have, in essence, provided for both of them to have some property interest in the ranch if one died. So, But maybe 100% wouldn't have been in tax. It I'm might not, not have been. Right. But, but it, would, have, it's, it sounds like the way they set this up is it would have provided for him while he was alive if she died first and vice versa. It sounds like the only debate here is what would happen once both of them were gone. And my understanding of that testimony, when I was taking notes on the verbatim of what came out of the witness's mouth, he said that they both wanted to provide something for Austin. It was just a question as to whether or not the ranch itself would go to him. Okay, but let's look at also the big picture, what we know. The will that was probated, or I think it was probated, is, 2000, is 2006 will, mm -hmm. right? They're trying to say there's a more recent will, but 2006 is the last will we know that she had. And this gentleman, uh, Hudson, met tax in 2009. So he enters the picture three years later. They made multiple appointments to change the wills, to, you know, to rectify this, and canceled multiple times, sometimes the day of. He said there absolutely was disagreement between the two of them, and he never created a new will. Who created Texas' new will that we saw and heard about earlier today? Presumably not this attorney. It no, must have been some other not attorney. this attorney. And why not this attorney, who had been reviewing everything with them and was intimately familiar with their desires and their records since 2009? Somebody else. I'm presumably going to hear from that person uh, coming up, I'm guessing. I, I don't know why. I, okay. I don't have a crystal ball. I can't This read is why the prosecution is putting this guy on, because they uh, it's going somewhere, I think. It's going somewhere, but he also said, okay, look, they both wanted to provide for this Austin, okay, so he, he wouldn't have been written off completely. It's just a question of where this piece of personal property goes, and I get that legally it's unique and that she had one wish for it and he had another, okay, but it's not like she was running to this guy saying, I want Tex to have nothing to do with this property immediately upon my death. Okay, he still would have been able to use and presumably own and enjoy that property in some fashion. That's what I took away from this. So he would have been taken care of. And the state is trying to insinuate here that he did this because he wanted to still have control and use of that property. I'm not seeing the case being made out that he wouldn't. Okay. okay, fair enough, fair enough. And I, the cynic, am looking at this saying this new will, which purports to carry out Diane's wishes and give the ranch eventually to Austin, I'm not convinced it's real. Until somebody declares it a, 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 a proper will, I don't think it is. Okay, well, I don't and think he did it to, to cover himself because he knew there was a criminal investigation. I don't think that they're trying to say that these correspondence with this particular witness, the estate attorney, they're not trying to say it's a valid will. They're trying to use it as evidence in a murder case. That's a different question. So, you know, they're not trying to say it's valid. It's they're not, not trying to... You can't separate it if it's invalid and he's, and he's using it to show that he's, he, he was never motivated to get the ranch himself, that he wanted to carry out her wishes. Uh, because that would look good for him in a criminal investigation. Maybe, maybe. Let's listen to some of the testimony from earlier today. We had William Corey, who worked with the victim on the stand. He started to get emotional when he talked about a memorial service. And one last question. Uh, at the memorial, um, did you have an opportunity, at the memorial at Corey services, did you have an opportunity to speak to the defendant? I spoke to him. Okay, and it's all I did. I just spoke to him. Okay, but there's a lot of people that I try and speak to. They were, they were very nice. I mean, Jay, Jay, for the first class um, celebration of life on the car. So she would have done the same thing for me. Okay, and do you remember if the defendants? What did he say to you? Or was it just a I just, love? I just spoke to him. Okay. I didn't invite anybody over there except the people who was on good terms were dying. And I'll let that be known. And you said 
she would have done the same thing for you. Is that because she loved you? Say that again. You said uh, she would have done the same thing for you. Is oh, that yeah. because she loved you? I, I announced it. I said, you don't need to have one of these things for me because I'm doing the same thing for her that she would have done for me. Thank you, Mr. Corey. I don't have any further questions, okay? That lot is for you if you want to take a sip. Okay. Ms. Clark Hall, any questions for Mr. Corey? Bill Corey, who worked with the victim, getting a little emotional there, recalling her memory. This particular witness also testified earlier today about some jewelry that the victim owned and where that jewelry would go. Here's how he described the defendant's actions towards that jewelry. Uh, the yeah, in the condo. Okay. And um, was it just the two of you? Yes. Okay. And um, do you remember uh, what the defendant said to you? He had, I don't know what I can say and what I can't say up here. <laughs> you can tell me what you said and what he said, but nobody else. When we finally wound up, they he wanted to see me. And when we finally wound up, in the, uh, we went away and sat down on the sofa, I think, in that room. Yes, sir. And I kept waiting for him to say it, what he what he wanted to see me about. So he didn't ever say anything. So I first thing I told him, I said, you, I said, Tex, you know, I think you ought to take all this jewelry Diane has, and I knew she had a, a ton of it. So I said, you ought to take it and put it in a safe, a safe deposit box. I, I was going to tell him, if he didn't want to, he didn't have anything to tell me, I was going to start telling him. Well, I thought, I said, y'all take all this urine and put it in a box, in a safe, uh, safe deposit box, and when Austin gets uh, grown and get to marry, uh, to marry, I said, hell, just tell me, give him, give him a hood and engage to what, give him one piece of it and don't, don't ever uh, let it all get up, go overboard. Y'all tell him that, and when he gets old enough, I didn't want that, all that expensive jewelry. I wanted Austin. I, I, Diane would have, would have uh, given it. That witness ultimately testified that this jewelry that he was inquiring about, that he had heard about, was ultimately not being held for Austin, that the defendant just remained silent when he suggested that it be held for Austin. We're going to take a break here on the Law & Crime Live Network. We'll be back with testimony in a moment. Welcome back, everybody. You're watching Law and Crime Live, and welcome again to those of you watching on the Crime and Investigation Network. We're covering the Tex McIver case out of Atlanta, Georgia, the case of an attorney who's accused of murdering his wife. The defendant says it was an accident. It looks like we're back in court live. Let's take you to the courtroom. This appears to be a discussion about an objection that happened right before we took our break. Basically, I don't like what Mr. Hudson laid out. So, because of the remoteness in time and because we don't have any concrete proposed changes that Ms. McIver wanted to do, um, that's why I'm asking the court to keep it out. We're going to take you back out of this because it looks like a very dry hearing. So let's listen now to some previous testimony. One of the victim's co-workers was on the stand earlier today. Let's listen yet again to some of his testimony. How long have you known uh, Oscar Schwab? Since he was five weeks old. Okay. And tell the jury um, how Diane felt about Austin Schwab. She was obsessed with Austin. She worshipped Austin. 
and um, tell the jury some of the things that she did for Austin. It'd be, I guess, it'd probably be easy to say some things she didn't do for him. <laughs> I can't think of anything that she didn't do for him. She'd take him, well, if Austin, if, if, uh, if Tex and I were in intensive care and Austin needs some toothpaste, she wouldn't think a thing about leaving us that make it, and she would take care of Austin now. I mean, she, she was strict with Austin now. I mean, she didn't put up with any foolishness with him. She, she paid for it, as I understand. She paid for his nursery. And one of my high class nurseries over there in Buckhead. And she'd go over there and get him, and she'd go to everything he had. And she'd done that all his life. If he, he'd call him and when he got old enough, he'd be calling her. She'd drop everything and talk to Austin. And what did Austin call uh, Diane? Called her Mama Diane. Okay. And uh, did uh, Miss Diane pay for tutoring for Austin? She said she told me she did. Okay. Did she buy his clothing? Uh, as far as I know, she bought everything he owned. Uh, because she'd take the clothes that he had outgrown and give them to some of those kids down there that needed them around, around the... That was testimony from earlier today from one of the victim's co-workers, Bill Corey, who was on the stand for quite a while earlier this afternoon. Beth Karras is still here with me on the Law and Crime Network. Beth, we heard there just how much the victim loved her godson, Austin. And that's turning into a key piece of this puzzle as far as the will is concerned and how the will may have been in the process of being changed. We have the estate attorney on the stand they're in the midst of a motion hearing right now. He's going to be back on the stand any moment. We'll bring you back there live as soon as it happens. But questions about exactly how they were thinking about changing the estate plan to possibly give the ranch to Austin. That's what they might have to really zero in on here in trying to prove part of motive. This attorney, Harold Hudson, was uh, about to say, I think, that Diane didn't want her half of the ranch, if she were to die first, to go to objection. So it was either Tex's sons, because if it 100% went to Tex, he could have given, although he's estranged from two of his sons, it appears, because his will says, right, that that will, whether it's real or not, says two sons get nothing, um, and the other one gets money, but no real estate. That she wanted it to go directly to Austin. So maybe if they had carried through with changing it, which they didn't under Hudson, or using Hudson, an LLC would have changed the joint tenancies. I'm not sure because I, I don't know like exactly what an LLC would have done, but he said it would have changed the rights of survivorship. So probably she could have left her 50% to um, to Austin. To Austin directly. But, but look, look, he still would have owned the other 50%. And, right. And, you he know, still Austin would have had, right. She wasn't Couldn't getting... have kicked him off the property, so she right. wasn't trying to kick text to the curb. Correct. 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 She was just ensuring that Correct. this... Uh, preferred beneficiary of hers would have had some ownership interest in the property. Right, because once she's gone, once she's dead, she really can't control what Tex does with it, even though he knew her wishes, right? I mean, mm -hmm. she's not here, so she wanted to ensure that Austin got his, that at least half, uh, but I'm still waiting to see if this will that Tex executed after Diane died is a valid will. That is the piece that we're waiting to hear possibly right after this witness so we're very curious along with you as to exactly where they're going to go with that but i want to continue reviewing some of the earlier testimony we had bill corey on the stand we just reviewed some of his testimony I want to move along now and listen to some of uh, the rest of his testimony this was a jury question that uh, he posed uh, that, or that was posed to him rather uh, and his answer was really interesting. So, uh, Beth, I'm curious to hear your response to this once we review it. A good amount of time. A good amount of time. Yeah. Now, I'm going to direct your attention to um, the morning of September 26th of 2016. Uh, did the defendant call you? He left a message on my voicemail about around 6 o'clock in the morning. 
And do you remember um, what that voicemail said? Says no. And after listening to the voicemail, did you call the defendant? I, when I went in, the, in my dressing room about uh, seven or seven, whatever time I went in, the, I saw what I did to return his call. And um, when you returned his call, what did the defendant tell you? He told me that Diane had been killed in a, in a firearms accident. Well, as I, I remember that it was, it, it kind of, I couldn't believe it. It kind of, sh it shocked me. And then he said, uh, then he said, Diane had been killed in a firearms accident. And it, it, it took me several days to, for that to, to, to realize that she had really, yeah, yeah, wasn't here anymore. And did he tell you? I guess how she was uh, killed in a fire. No, that's all he said. As I, saw, as I recall, that's all. That's, that's, that, that's the only time he said anything to me about what happened to Diane. Okay. Um, so you said the only time. So in all the conversations that you've had, did he ever give you any more details about how Diane was killed other than um, it was an accident? It was a firearms accident? No. After getting off the phone with the defendant, uh, do you remember what you did next? Call him, Jay. Don't tell me what, you, what what Jay said. You can tell us what you said to Jay. What I said to Jay? Yes. Yeah. Come over here, let's go down. Now, in part in response to what you just heard, the jury asked this witness a very specific question. I want to listen to that next. Do you remember the question that was asked? You asked me if I had ever asked Tex about what happened to him. And you said no. And then Mr. Abate said, well, why didn't you? And he paused. Uh, I'm going to ask you to answer that now, if you would, please. I, I figured if he wanted to tell me what happened to her, hell, I knew what happened to her. He shot her in the back. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Anything else, Ms. Clark Palmer? An interesting back and forth there between a witness who worked with the victim and attorneys on both sides. Beth, I wanted to ask your reaction to this. I was curious how he was allowed to testify about all of this. He's not a direct witness, okay? And a few people online were jumping in and saying, well, it's a prior consistent statement. It can get in to prove that he's said the same thing all along. But, you know, how is it relevant? How is it probative what this guy heard from the friend who was in the car? I mean, it just sounds like he said this, he shot her in the back, and he said it very affirmatively, and it might stick in the minds of the jurors. He wasn't there to see any of it go down. But he it's wasn't, a fact that's not in dispute. It's a fact that's not in dispute, but it's in dispute exactly how it happened. How was the defendant holding the gun? Did he have his finger on the trigger or not? Was the gun cocked or not? How was the gun pointed? Was the defendant asleep? All of these things are where this case is really going to sit. Okay, not on whether or not this guy just affirmatively wants to go out and say he shot her in the back, which makes it sound malicious. Well, I mean, the jurors had asked whether or not he asked for you know, text uh, more of an explanation for what happened that evening, I believe. And he's like, well, I didn't really need to hear more. I knew what he did. He shot her in the back. 
And, you know, he, he's a, he, ta he said a little bit more about what other people said. Sometimes we do hear that what are technical violations to evidentiary rules in the courtroom, but judges have a little wiggle room and discretion and allow it. And um, I didn't find it so unusual that he was able to testify to what he just did. What I do find unusual, there are things throughout the course of this case that jumped up, and like I've got a lot of questions about prior testimony. We all testimony. do. We all do. We have to take a break, though. You're watching the Law and Crime Network live on Crime and Investigation. A big moment in court just now as we looked at emails back and forth between the victim and the defendant about what was going to happen to this ranch that was in dispute. The emails with the victim's own words saying, I don't want my half of the ranch to go to your estate. Beth, this is making out the case that she did want it to go to the godson, Austin. But, let, well, for a minute we thought we were going to go back, but apparently there's, there's another pause in court. But this is a really important part of this for the state. Right. So now this is a, one of those rare times when we hear a voice from the grave. Mm -hmm. This is her intent in January of 2011. And, um, you know, we saw the emails on screen where she's like, we, he said, we, what don't we agree to? And she's like, I'm not going to leave my half to your estate, which is exactly what happened. When she died, her half went to him. Because the old will was in effect, and this right. was a communication about a possible new will, and right. it ultimately wasn't finalized before she died. Right. But I'm sure that the defense is going to characterize this to say, look, she wanted to change where it went when both of them ultimately died, because if she gave it away to Austin, he would still have 50% of it. But let's listen to how the witness phrases this. In 2009. What date? December. This is State's Exhibit 147.14. And... This email is from um, who? Me. To who? Tex MacGyver. What date? May 5th, 2011. So if um, this email that we just looked at was January 26, 2011, we are a few months after that, correct? Correct. Okay. We are watching as an estate planning attorney testifies about proposed changes to the will that the defendant shared with the victim. And this is a big back and forth because apparently the victim wanted part of her share of a farm to go to someone other than Tex. Let's take a break. We'll be back live in a moment.